So my name's Anthony Reimer. Um, if someone's in the booth, the mic is a hair live. Um, at least for me. Great, thank you. Uh, I'm from the University of Calgary. As you might have seen earlier today, let's see if it does that well. Someone was nice enough on Twitter to take a picture of where everyone is from. See way up on the mountainside on the top there? That's me. Uh, I come to you from the University of Calgary, and if any of you are hockey fans, you'll know approximately where that is, but you know, over by the Rocky Mountains. Um, so I was be not being facetious when I said, um, you know, my boss, you know, we, it, it's not cheap to come here, but this is such a great conference. It's worth coming whenever I can. So today's, the topic I'm going to talk about today is modular image creation. Um, I will take time to define it um, because I'm kind of a pedagogy guy. Um, I will talk about the rationale too. So why should you image? And if you're going to image, why should you do it modularly? I'll talk about some of the techniques you need for modular uh, that are different from the old golden master, golden image type method. I will give you a survey of what is a surprisingly broad number of tools available for modular image creation. And then I'm going to go in depth with uh, the current king of the castle, auto damage. So um, in, sure. Uh, in my realm, uh, I'm a musician by training and a teacher by training. Um, there's a famous uh, wind band conductor who, who used to say this a lot, and I'm sure he's not the only one. I've heard it in other places. But when I'm up here in front of a group like this, uh, I want to know a little bit more about you, because as much as this is being recorded, um, I have um, this presentation is for you. If people at a later date get a benefit of it, that's great. But this presentation is for you. So first of all, um, can I see a, just a show of hands? How many of you currently use the method I alluded to before, where you have a golden machine, you install everything on it, you capture it, and you push it out? OK, great. This, you were in the right place. Um, how many of you have um, built images modularly before using like something like instant image or something? So that's great. Um, I, hopefully, this will uh, give you some tips to move over to something like auto damage. But what I'll also do is I'll now add in a couple things that I don't even have in the decks that will help you transition. Um, some of you may have read an article I posted on how you could still use Insta up to date with auto damage. And I can, go, I can talk about that if you like. Um, how many of you um, are already going to where you're just making a minimal image and then throwing everything in in the customizing phase? Any of you doing that? OK. Um, there might not be as much for you in this, um, but you're welcome to stay. If, it, if you find that it's not what you want, feel free. You're not going to offend me if you leave. Um, we will cover making that, and that's, in fact, the demo, uh, the demo portion that I've got recorded. But I will be going into a little more depth than some of the other. How many of you are relatively new to the Mac platform? Maybe you're a Windows or Unix min, admin, or are you all old Mac hands? OK, so a few, few of you. And how many of you were here in this room all day yesterday? OK, for those of you, there's going to be a little bit of review. So thanks, be patient. But they haven't heard some of the stuff on terminology before, so I will want to go over that. All right, so oops, sorry. So the, the real question is, why image? That's the one I want to start you with, because that's not a given anymore. The main reason I want to say that is because some people, when they say we're going to image a machine, they just mean we're going to do something that automates deployment of software. And some people say we're going to use, we want to use a physical image to push out everything. OK? Um, when I talk about the deployment cycle, so getting a machine from either an unknown or an undesired state all the way to the desired state, which we will then maintain, um, this is the terminology I like to use, going from unknown to a known bootable state to a desired. Because every machine we have either goes through that or starts right at the known part, right? In other words, a new computer out of the box from Apple will be at the known state because you know it's a known bootable system. It may be undesired to you and you may choose to nuke and pave it, like in those instances where you have to use an OS that is not currently on the, on the Mac. In which case, for you, you just treat it like unknown. But everything we talk about in deployment, that's the terminology I use. So some people 
we'll call that imaging. For me, the imaging portion is just the part between unknown and known, if you choose that. So I call, this, I call that whole cycle deployment. And breaking that down, when we talk about imaging on this side of this diagram, we, we want to talk about two things. Image creation, because you have to create the image first. And then what peop some people will call imaging or just um, deploying an image. Now, there are other methods. Uh, and if you heard yesterday, we went over them in some detail. Or you can now, you don't have to image anymore. You can just install an OS uh, and be done with it using, a, using a, uh, basically a, a package made out of the uh, OS X installer, assuming you're using 10.7 and later, of course, and then throw anything else you want into the customizing phase. So what we're focusing on today is that second thing. Why do we use images for deployment? And then once we've made that choice, what are the tech techniques we can use? So like I said, I have to always ask the question, is imaging the best choice for you? Right? And there are a whole bunch of things that you, we can talk about. Uh, and we do have a lot of time at the end for questions if you want. But this slide that uh, Kevin White made um, for the Max Sysadmin conference in Sweden last September, you can watch the whole video if you like. It's on the maxsysadmin.se website. Um, I mean, he's the guy who wrote the book. I mean, he literally writes some of the Apple training manuals for, for the OSs for people like us, right? Um, these were the four reasons that he come up, came up with for the times where imaging, using an image makes sense. Um, so in summary, create a ba base system image for testing or recovery. Great usage. Environments that are often reset. Uh, labs are often a use for, you, you know, where you have, especially like in my situation, my labs, we have local accounts only, and so people save stuff on there all the time, and at a certain point, we need to nuke them and repave, right? And then the other choice might be a truly homogeneous environment where you've got all of one model, or it's a very homogeneous, yeah, it's you got very little variation, right? So those are the uh, those are the reasons he says are could convince you to continue imaging rather than using install only type methods. But I'd like to add a couple of my own. Um, when speed or bandwidth matters, if you've got a slow network, um, you know, a, a ten pushing ten gigabytes over the network, or you're not in control of the network, and you're gonna you know you're gonna get heat for pushing ten gigs out at a certain point. Uh, for an image that, or actually to use an install method so it's going to keep pounding it, that might be a problem. Images are certainly the most efficient way to push bits, right? Because it, you're just literally pushing bits, not the installers which then place files, et cetera, et cetera. And the other reason, and it's one of the reasons I have not gone away from using an image at this point, is large uh, static elements that'll be, that, you know, software that doesn't change much, but does you always need on your image. So for example, the big example for me is Logic Pro. Um, I've got, because the professor I work with wants not only the, you know, when they recently updated all the samples, right? Uh, and so I took out the old ones and just put all the new ones in. Oh no, we want the old ones too. 50 gigs, seriously. Um, I do have a method that I could use to install the 40 packages that make up those 50 gigs, at this point, I have a methodology that has those installed on my modularly built image, right? That's what I've chosen. And so for me, that's right now a good reason to stick with this methodology. But as your payload grows, things like speed and size start to matter more. If you're only a handful of machines, then many of the install-only methods will still work for you very nicely. Um, so let's say you've, you've gone through that criteria and you say, yes, I see myself in one of these scenarios, or it's going to take me a while to migrate over to an install only type method, a no imaging type method. So I'm going to build images still. So why, why would I say do it modularly? Does, does everyone know what I mean by modularly? Yes? So who doesn't? I'll be happy to explain it. OK, great. So. 
Uh, let's take you back to last September. Uh, it's September 12th, and OS 8 10.8.5 rolls out. Um, great, not so great for me. Uh, I just created an image with 10.8.4 because it's the beginning of term, and now we're th for three days into classes, and we got an OS update. Luckily, I have ways to deal with that, but it's all right. It's OK. Fine, I can deal with that. Uh, and then, 12 days later, oh, look, Apple releases a new iMac. It has a custom build of 10.8.5. Right? Let's say you buy one of these anytime you're still using 10.8, right? Let's say you haven't gone to Mavericks yet. Um, so you buy one of these and it ships with 10.8.5 or you want it to run. Um, you want it to run Mountain Lion, right? So you just, oh, okay, I don't, maybe I didn't know there was a custom build and because it said 10.8.5, it didn't say anything about, you know, was it 12E 2015? I think it was. That was the build. So you copy your image over and you get the nice flashing do not enter sign. Well, that image isn't very golden anymore, is it? Because now I can't use it everywhere. So let's say you were silly enough to do that. How do, I, how do you get out of that situation? You've wiped. Maybe it's the only machine you have with, that's of, like that, right? You've got no way to recover. What's the best? Well, how do you get out of it? Well, if you're using the, the golden machine method, quite frankly, the, you go through these six steps. Uh, because the most efficient way, quite frankly, is to build a new master using Apple's own uh, migration assistant, quite frankly. You know, install your image on a hard drive, then boot up your new, uh, you know, get, you know, erase and re reinstall the OS, you know, maybe download it from internet, reco you know, internet recovery, then take that machine and go through the setup and say, oh yeah, migrate that over, then go and capture that so now you have an image for those, just specifically for those iMacs, right? It works. It's not pretty. If you're using it in a modular way, all you'd have to do is get the install, installer for the operating system, right? That you needed for that particular build of that OS. And maybe you were, had some forethought and you backed up that, it, that machine before you nuke and paved it, right? Um, so you, I, maybe that's the way you got it. Maybe you got it through internet recovery or through the recovery partition, and literally take the current OS out of your modular build, put in the specific one, say, make me a new image, and it's done. Right? This is the joy of modular, because you can take one component out, put another one in. You know, When we're dealing with packages, you can take multiple out, multiple in. It works great. I do have to, as a, um, a um, hold my heart to the you know, best practices community, I do have to say that if you were using an install only type method where like using something like monkey, there was no problem because we never nuked the OS, right? That's one of the benefits of that particular method. So I, I mention that to you only because that's something you may be wanting to look for in the future. So um, my internet meme for the day, um, please follow the, what well, I know the most interesting man in the world from the Dos Equis beer commercials would say uh, about this. I don't always create images, but when I do, I make them modularly. I create them modularly, right? Here's another case that was actually happened to me. Um, I had a situation where um, a class in January, a couple classes, wanted to use Motion 5 and Final Cut Pro 10. We were at the time we were on 10.6.8. We had not deployed Lion. Um, and of course, those apps required Mountain Lion. But we also had replaced some machines uh, midterm. And so now we had 16 existing machines and five new machines. We had to replace them because, quite frankly, they didn't meet the specs of Motion 5 and Final Cut Pro 10. They were Mac Minis. And so we dumped the 2009 Mac Minis, bought them in the late 2012 Mac Minis. But they had a separate build. Right? Uh, we haven't finished the nightmare yet. Um, reports at the time were that the initial version of Final Cut Pro 10 and Final Cut Pro 7, which is what we had on our image, didn't, didn't like each other. So I didn't have the option of just piling on to my existing image. Right? Oh, and yeah, I just have to do it in the, the two week break or two to three week break between um, the end of the winter term or the end of the fall term and the beginning of the winter term in January. 
Do you think that would be accomplishable using a golden image type situation? It would be hard to get all the cruft off, right? Uh, get, get all the remnants of Final Cut Pro 7 off and stuff. And I have to tell you, I already have, at this point, my payload's already over 100 gigs. So I also don't want to push out 150 gigs when I don't have to, especially on the Mac minis that still only had 320 gig hard drives, right? I was able to do this because I could simply go, oh, Final Cut Pro 7 Studio, take those packages out. Motion 4, take those packages out. Okay, let's make, let's bundle up a package for Final Cut Pro. Let's figure out what else it downloads, put those packages in, and then same for Motion 5, right? We didn't start smoothly on term, but I had computers up and running, and luckily they tend to start slow. They, you know, they do some introductory stuff. So we made it. Well, I should say I made it. During that break, I don't have any student help either. Um, so the last bit got finished when I had student help. But that is the main advantage of using a modular rather than install and capture. When you do a modular method, you're installing onto a disk image. You're not installing onto like a, a boot volume. So it's never been booted. That means basically the only cruft that could draft in is in packages that you create that, or, or any misbehaved packages. You're not getting any odd conflicts in the, in the back room. As I mentioned in a couple examples, you can swap out OSs. It's very easy. It's just take that package out, put that package in. The thing I like about it, because I've been using modular for quite a while, is it's self-documenting, right? Because you know, if you go and you, you install everything onto a single machine, you say, how did I do that? You know, how did I make that finder preference in the sidebar? How did I make the text bigger? If you don't remember, you have to go dig around. When we're doing it modularly, the only way to really do that is to push out a setting through a package or through um, maybe even a P list if that's what you're doing. Um, so because it's already there, you can go, oh yeah, there it is. That's how I did that, right? And maybe that's what needs to change when we change, you know, if there's an incompatibility with an OS. Packages are useful pretty much everywhere. Uh, how many of you use Al uh, Apple Remote Desktop? You can use packages there, right? So if you use, so if you start building your own packages for this, or even start, you know, collecting packages, anything you want can be sent out. So you're already building packages. It can be, you can use them elsewhere. And this is the thing I like, and some of the tools don't do this well, but InstaDimage and AutoDamage have always done this well, is if you need to have multiple images for whatever reason, uh, I think, you know, and I gave one example, custom builds until the next OS release, right? If you need to have multiple images for whatever reason, since most of these are configured through either text files or plist files, you can have multiple variations and just say, this time I'd like to build from this load. This time I'd like to build from this load. You can have the same package repository, you know, the same, same let's draw from here, but you just give it different instructions to build each time, right? Less duplication of effort, right? All right, so one of the, what are the techniques you need to add to your toolkit when you're doing modular deployment? Well, what I just mentioned, packages, packages and more packages. How many of you have made your own packages? How many of you have not made your own packages? How many of you have modified vendor packages? Oh, the truly brave. Um, for those of you who have made your own packages, um, well, actually, I'll go over, I'll go over some tools. Uh, I'll actually, I'll, I'll deal with that in a sec. Um, one of the things about packages is they are useful in all stages, from image creation to the customizing phase to maintenance. But some pack, not all packages are well behaved or you know some packages are more equal than others when we use modular deployment uh, modular image creation I should say packages do fail and the most common reasons they fail can be summed up in one word they assume for example they assume that they're being installed on a booted volume Right? When we're using a modular approach, we're installing on a disk image. So 
if a script says install in the boot volume, well, it'll install on your boot volume, but not the one you want. Um, some installers assume you're running it from the GUI. And others insist that there be a user logged in. You may have already come across this using ARD, where if there's a user logged out and you send a package and it says it did it or it maybe even fails, but it doesn't actually have any effect, maybe your package insists that a log user be logged in. I'm trying to remember. Can anyone remember there's one prime example of that? I, I think it's an Adobe package of some sort, the non-enterprise versions. But um, since I'm being recorded, I love Adobe. I did not, I do, since I have no exact evidence, I cannot say it was an Adobe package, but DPS tools? OK. So what's the solution when you come across a package that fails? And I've kind of referred to them already. You can repackage. And so there are tools out there that I'll discuss in a moment that'll be happy to repackage for you. They'll figure out what actually got installed and make a new package. You can modify the original package. Some of you said you already have already did that. Uh, if you don't know how to do that um, from yesterday's workshop, excuse me for a sec, um, Von Miller did a, a session on uh, modifying vendor packages. It wasn't recorded, but his slide deck is up there. And there are also some presentations from previous years that will will cover that cover that. And the third one, which is these days, if you can, it's the preferred solution. Deploy somewhere else in the workflow. So for example, if you don't want to repackage or you've got a recalcitrant package that won't install on an image, maybe it's better, let's say if you're using Deploy Studio, to add a step in your workflow that says install this package on first boot. Right? That is certainly, of these, I would say they're in reverse order of which way you would do them. Right? You should think about, can you deploy it some other way first? And then maybe I'll modify the vendor package. Um, and if you want to modify the vendor package, you might want to look into auto package as well. That's the new kid on the block. And then repackage is a last resort. Um, there's some fairly famous packages that don't work in when you put them in a modular build for images. You may have heard of these products. Right? So this is one of the reasons, for example, um, I will give Adobe props at this point, not trying to suck up again, um, that they have for Creative Suite, it's uh, Amy, and for Creative Cloud, it's uh, CCP. They have tools that will build Apple native packages. And even if you're in volume licensing, it can say, well, you know, okay, enter the serial number automatically. Don't ask for updates because I'm going to manage them. Those type of things. Lovely tools. They do not work when you try to install them on a non-booted image. So that is one, for example, in my workflow. It goes in the Deploy Studio workflow, and here are the packages I'd like you to install on first boot. So just copy the packages over to the drive, and then on first boot, install these. Right? Um, same with Office. It works very cleanly that in that way I just described. Some people, uh, currently I do repackage Office only because it's a lab, and I don't want Outlook. So that ended up being the easiest way for me to remove Outlook from the, uh, from the, uh, from the build. So when you start building packages specifically for this type of workflow, for modular image creation, these are some of the, th the things you should, uh, that I've learned that I'd like to share. Um, my testing machine, and that was one thing I learned in my, fr the my first Mac and Min's conference I went to, have, have a testing machine that's just for testing. And these days, I would even say if you, are, if you don't have a homogeneous environment, you might also want to have um, something like uh, uh, VMware Fusion, for example, so that you can run test virtual machines for the types that you want. But have a testing machine and have your setup such that if you have local users that you know will be on the machines you deploy, for example, your admin account, whether you're, you know, it's a backdoor admin account or not, um, that's the way I like to have my, my, my packaging and imaging station set up so I know it's going to have the same user ID, you know, the same everything. You'll notice if you use a, any of you use Composer out of the Casper suite, you'll notice that some of the manifests they use have, for something like Office, for example, have files that are in the user space, like the user account space. 
My preference is to take those out, just literally edit, edit those out of the, before you build the package. And that's because the experience I've had is if you actually push things out to a user account that you know will be there, but isn't there right now, when it tries to populate the default folders from the user template, when it hits something that already exists, it will stop. So I've had things where I, you know, I push some, you know, early days, I push something into library preferences on the, in the user's account, because I have a local standard user on all my machines, excuse me. What ended up happening was it went, you know, desktop, documents, library, and it never, and it stopped, because it found existing files. So it never built movies, pictures, et cetera. If that, I mean, that may not be important to you, but, those type of side effects happen if you don't segregate user and uh, system level files. And the, the thing that's neat about um, building a package for these is the ability to put a serial number, like figure out how your app is serializing and install it that way. That's something I actually use, I do use Composer to figure out where the, uh, you do a, a snapshot which is basically using FS events to figure out what's going where. And then I say, oh, it changed this and this. These are the files that have it. I mean, I've got one where the serial number is actually in the app bundle as a file. And so every time I run an update or try to reinstall it, I, it'll, sometimes it actually wipes it. So I actually have to have that ready and install it, and that's in my workflow. I've alluded to some packaging tools. Let me just give you a list. Um, the slide deck will be available afterwards, so you don't have to go furiously typing. Uh, and in fact, all the URLs I put in there are live, so you can even just click on them when you download the slides. Uh, package build and package util are command line utilities that are already on your machine, unless you're running 10.6 uh, or earlier, in which case you have to download them as part of uh, I think developer tools with Xcode, I can't remember, but um, those are available. Packages, that's its killer feature is if you need to package a drag and drop app. How many of you use uh, white box packages? You know this feature, right? Put packages in the dock. Mount a, let's say Firefox, which is one of those drag and drop apps. Drag Firefox onto the packages icon. It builds it, it packages it ready to, do, to go to deploy in whatever way you see fit, right? Whichever part of the workflow you go. That's its killer feature, but it can also do many more things. Composer from Jamf, $100, $80 for education, included in the Casper suite if, if you're a Casper place, but you don't have to be. Like I said, its biggest benefit is snapshotting, doing before and after, figuring out what changed so that you can package that. I did mention the Adobe specific tools already. Um, and I, for where they use it. If you want to inspect packages, there are two tools that are useful. Um, Pacifist from Charles Soft, it's only $20. And basically you drag any package on it, it tells you, okay, here are the contents, here's the scripts that were involved. It's really great. And your ability to edit it is good. The one I use a lot is Suspicious Package. It hasn't been updated for a while, but it, it's because it still works. It's a quick look plugin. So literally, if you have a package in the finder, just hit the space bar, and it will give you a list of the contents. And you can also see any of the scripts in the package as well. Really cool. Uh, it's free. Uh, and I, have, I always install it on the machines I'm doing uh, using my module image creation with. Here are some other techniques that I'm not going to go into in any detail that you will want to pick up. And that's partially because. I'm not really good at any of them yet, but they are very useful. <laughs> um, scripting, uh, if you, any of you do shell scripting, that's great. You're gonna wanna set a lot of settings, use payload free packages, you know, put a script in a package and just send it. If you don't know much about scripting, are, there are already two sessions uh, starting the next two days. I'm really looking forward to the Friday one. You'll see me at the Friday one. Uh, that's also gonna be I can't remember where it is, but that's also good. Get there early to that one. There's already like 82 people signed up or something. Uh, for profiles, that is certainly the way forward in managing settings, you know, with that. I currently use MCX, but I am more than aware that it's going the way of the Dodo Bird. Still works in 10.9, and that's why I'm deploying this fall, so I'm going to stick with it for a little while longer. 
Uh, but there are two sessions tomorrow afternoon on profiles. Uh, especially, for example, those of you using the golden machine method, you may have decided, OK, the way to control users, what they can do, is go and turn on parental controls. Is that what some of you do? Any of you? Yeah, yeah. So this profiles, I would say skip MCX and go directly to profiles, because that is the way, the way forward. That's the, essentially the replacement for going in and doing parental controls, being able to lock certain things down, and in some ways also give permissions or set up apps um, with particular settings. And then launch, ag la launch agents. Those are the things that when a user logs in, start up, right, and, and uh, do an action. Launch daemons are the ones that are system-wide. As, as an admin, some of the things you would have gone in on a golden machine image and just said, OK, like I want to change this and this and this, can often be handled with a launch agent if you can't handle them with profiles. OK, so that something happens every time and says, this is what I want to do. OK, that's all I'm going to say on those topics other than learn more. I know I need to learn more there, too. OK, so. Maybe you've said, OK, well, I'm here. I might as well learn a bit more about what tools are they, since I've said, you know, if you're going to build images, build them modularly. What tools are out there? Well, I will say one, there is one rule in all the tools that I have found that whatever the machine you're using, whatever operating system that machine has, that is also the, the image that you need to build. I guess maybe the. That's easier. I said it better on the slide, didn't I? The boot OS is also the build OS. So if you want to build a Mavericks image, you need to be working on a machine, or potentially a virtual machine, that is running Mavericks. It doesn't have to be, one can be, let's say, 10.9.3 and one's 10.9.4. It does not have to be the, the last point issue. But um, you may choose to save your repository of packages in a neutral spot so that you can access it from different boot partitions, for example. But when you're actually going to use one of these modular tools and build it, you have to be on the same OS. OK, that sometimes it will fail for no reason. And that is the most common way that it fails. So there's actually a lot of tools. This is the granddaddy. This is the one I used until last year. Um, Instant image, uh, and then later added to it Insta up to date. Uh, it was command, it's command line only. It basically only works from 10.5 to 10.8. To uh, it, it, it was born in 2007, late 2007, and it served the community very well. It was very influential. Um, for those of you who still want to use it, it is a perfectly fine tool. And Johan Gini, who uh, presented this morning, he's actually here from France. Um, if, you want, if you still want to use Instant Image, Go talk to him. I mean, I'm happy. I'm sure he'll be happy to hear. Um, the thing, the feature that was nice about Instant Image, especially after Insta Update, Insta Up to Date came along, was that you could have catalogs of files and say, I want this package, this package, and you could have nested things. So, for example, my Instant Image stuff looked like I want uh, all my music notation products. I want all my, um, I want Office. You know, I had these separate templates or separate catalogs that had these things. And I could have a catalog say, include this catalog, include this catalog. And that's how I got my variations. It was easy to go from my regular machine to one of the ones I was handing down. And it really just had to have Office and an OS on it. Right? I could do those independently. How many of you, just for interest, how many of you are using system image utility? OK. Um, understand that. System image utility is essentially a modular tool. Uh, I mean, you can use it to capture images as well. But when, if you're using net install, it's essentially just an installer. If you use net restore, it is physically possible um, for it to create a never booted image. And then you just go and extract it. And let's say you want to put it into Deploy Studio. You absolutely can. And there is the instruction that I will leave for you. It is not for the faint of heart. It's not bad, but it is certainly possible. And I know there's uh, even an extension that I um, saw in an Apple session that helps along with that. You may be able to find that out there. Of course, Google has, can has image. 
uh, they, they were using this internally and then decided to release it publicly. Uh, the methodology it uses is basically uh, a couple folders on a server, right? like basically one for the OS and one for all your packages. And then you just tell it, OK, see that up there? Build an image. It also has a, a command line interface to it. I had to add this one because I heard about it on the AFP 548 podcast recently. Um, system, system Image Creator uh, from Duncan McCracken at Mondata in Australia. It's different yet in that it has, I call it a terminal-based user interface. Think of the, for those of you who are as old as I am, think of uh, either old DOS or Apple II type apps that had, you know, like, okay, here are your four choices. Press one, two, three, or four. One, okay, here are your choices. Press one, two, or three. Are you sure why? So it's kind of, a, it's kind of got that interface to it. But as he said, his main reason was he wanted to do what some people would call a thin image, just a baseline, just or what I tend to call a lowest common denominator or a common image. We just want this on every machine and then we'll add stuff later. Right? We just want some, that's what he designed it for. Um, but people have used it for more because it certainly supports that. Then there's Stu by uh, Joe Chilcote, uh, who works for Adobe. My understanding is, um, or actually when I look at it, it basically looks like uh, instant image, but with the checksums taken out and no nesting of catalogs. So if you only needed about, you know, maybe you know, five to 20 packages, you could just simply, pretty much just list them in a file. He, said he likes to have his repository on the server, although it could be local, and just say, go ahead and build image. But when I, oh, I, for, when I asked him um, about it over Twitter, he basically said, you know, if, if your needs meet my needs, I'm happy to you know, use my tool. Otherwise, I would recommend the tool I'm going to recommend to you if you're just starting. And in fact, it's the mo it is currently updated and is the it is, you, you've probably already heard a little bit about it uh, if you've been at some others, if you were at the workshops yesterday, for example, or heard little scuttlebutts, little bits in here or there. And that's Auto Damage by Para Olofsson uh, out of Sweden. Uh, that's where uh, the GitHub repository is for it. And he really designed this as the successor to Instant Image. Originally, it was a GUI only ter um, tool. He added command line interface, so if you want that, that's available to you. But it is slick and easy, and is what I am now using. Uh, you're wondering how I get auto damage out of that, I bet. Well, that's because I, the joy of Twitter, I asked Pear what his per preferred pronunciation was. Because with instant image, the creators called it instant image. I started calling it instant image because I didn't want to spit out the D every time. And Alistair Banks, who took over the projects, called it an Insta DMG, right? So I asked him what his preference was. Because it had shown up, and he said, well, the Insta damage thing was a joke, but it kind of stuck. So that's what we're calling it. Uh, let's take a look at all those tools in perspective here, right? Um, this is one of those, if you're looking to choose what tool you'd like to use, this is the chart you take home and compare, you know, compare what features you might want, might, what might suit your workflow. But the killer feature for me for auto damage is right here. You can, have, you can install packages. You can install a package that's on in a, dim it, in a disk image. You can install an app that's in a disk image. And the feature that's unique is you can install an app that's on the system. You just drag it in, and it works. Um, there would be reasons you might not want to do that, but I will give you one specific case uh, in the, through the demos that you might want to do that. OK, so I've said that I use auto damage. <laughs> Spit that out. I said I, I've used auto, I use auto damage. So let's see it in action. Um, so what I'm going to do in this demo, uh, which, of course, since I'm presenting with an iPad, is pre-recorded, I used these, these elements. And if you happen to have 
these elements with you, you can do the demo along with me. Um, so the Auto Damage app, an OS installer, the same as the OS you've got in your lap or on the, on the desk in front of you. Create user package. How many of you are familiar with that tool? Yeah, it's great. So, and I'll talk about it in a sec. <coughs> if that's all you, if you don't have an OS installer and you just want to download that right now, that would, you'll see how easy that is. And then anything you'd like to add using those same four options that I gave you, a package, an app, uh, and either of those within a disk image, right? So create user package. That's, that's the interface. That's it. Everything you need is right there. So let me just go through it. So you just, just like you would with any user, you give the full name, the short name, password, and verify. The user ID, it defaults to 499. Oh, sorry. It defaults to 499. Uh, re for those of you who are Casper users, there was a recent problem where if you had user IDs under 500, you just couldn't see them. So your mileage may vary, as they say. You may want to manually change this. And certainly, if you're installing more than one user, you create a separate package for each user, you will want to change that, because you don't want two users that are 499, right? You then have um, account type administrator or standard, where the home directory is. It will generate a UUID for you automatically. You can check. There's a checkbox there if you want it to automatically log in. Frequently, you don't, but that is available to you. And then reverse, no uh, reverse domain notation for what you want the package to be named. Right? And then you can even version it. So that. So just before you do that, then you'll also notice there's a drop image here area up there. Uh, it does not have a picker into the standard pictures. So if you want to use one of the standard pictures from Apple's system, go into slash library slash user pictures, and that's where you'll find all the standard Apple pictures. And you can just then drag and drop that on. But if you want an image of your own, a corporate image, whatever, you can just drag and drop that. So. Let's see how easy this is. So you see on the right, I've opened Auto Damage, and that's its basic interface. A place to drag and drop uh, OS installers, um, a place where the updates will uh, populate, and place for additional software. So the way I've organized mine is I have um, all my installers in this one folder in the shared, actually in the shared user shared is where I put it. Uh, OS installers. I've got those and uh, templates, which is which I'll talk about later. That's um, for those of you using like you've used Instant Image. That's the equivalent of a catalog. Uh, for those of you using Monkey, it's the same, pretty much the same as a manifest. Um, so let's see how that goes. So I go over, I click in my own installers. I did this a month ago, so it was only ten nine three. It takes a look, it examines, it says, oh, OK, uh, that particular build needs those four updates. And then you can just click on download to get them. Right? One of the things it does when it starts up, it, is actually, it goes, actually goes back and says, has the updates catalog changed recently? Because Pear uh, maintains that. It will then download the latest, up, latest list of things you'd want to update. So I had done this before. So it, they are already downloaded, so I don't need to download them again. It has cached them for me. right? And it even tells me all updates are downloaded. So next, I then go over and I go into my packages. And I start dragging things in. So that clear reg, which is what I use to just touch those two files, that means we're not going to go through the registration, the setup assistant. Then I dragged in the package that I just created. And then, in this case, this is my tech image, so I want text wrangler on it. Again, you can see this. I did this a month ago. The current version is 10, 4, uh, 459, I should say. So I just dragged in the disk image that has the text wrangler uh, drag and drop app in it, right? So at this point, we're ready to build. So we go on. We click on build. It asks where we want to save it. It suggests a name. Um, because this is my tech disk, I want to call it tech. And because I'm anal retentive about four-digit four years, I type in 2014. 
And I go ahead and, oh, my, de um, my Deploy Studio repository s happens to be quickly uh, connected on the sidebar, so I save it there. So then it goes and starts preparing. It checks through everything first. And then when it figures, oh, I'm ready to install, then it asks you to authenticate. So don't just click build, save, and then walk away. You will need to authenticate to start it installing. But then it starts creating the di disk image. While you're there, you can go and take a look and see the detailed log that's being spit out. Because what it's, uh, you know, while it's installing onto the disk image. OK? Simple enough? Pretty simple, right? So then you, so the, here's my time lapse. So you then wait 20 minutes, and ta-da, it's done. Uh, it tells you it's done. It also then, you can also say, well, where is it in the finder? Just click on reveal, or you can just go OK. Uh, the logs now in the latest version are automatically saved, but you can also uh, look at them at that time. So that's it. It's no more complicated than that. that so for some of you, if you're doing a minimal image, that may be all you need to know. Right? However, some of you, especially if you're coming from a larger payload and, or want to do what I do, and you might want to do something a little more. Well, Pear has added those features for you. One of the things that InstaDimage had that a lot of other tools don't, don't and still don't is a cached OS install. So I just did that, right? And, I, and it's, let's say it probably took about 20 minutes when I did that. To, re to install an OS from scratch like that. But, so I've got that disk image. In, for those of you who used InstaDimage, you'll know that what it did was the first time you installed a, a sub-point release of an OS, it would check to see if it had it. And if it didn't, it would install it from scratch, but cache the uh, OS portion, just the initial install, so that the next time you did it using the same, let's say, 10.9.3, 10.9.3, it could skip that 20 minutes and start building. Well, this goes one step further. So I'm going to go back into that original image that we just built. There it is right there. And I'm going to drag it in where the, it says the OS installer is. And it's going to check it. And it's go, wow, I can now use that as my base now. Right? So. I'm going to now, let's say, well, I had those other things. Maybe I want a second local user. So I'll drag that in. And well, OK, I want Firefox. You can tell that's also an older release. And oh, wait for it. I've got an App Store app that I haven't bothered to package yet. So I just, I'm just going to drag Garage, GarageBand directly in there from the Applications folder. And it's probably the whole, uh, probably need the whole I life suite to be complete, right? Uh, because I, so I'm just going to drag those in and click build. Once again, it'll ask me to save the new image, but I want you to take a look. Where after I've followed my own uh, anal retentive naming scheme, I'd like you to notice what the what it does when it starts installing. So last time it said starting install, okay, does that, and then it started installing the OS. Take a look at how long it takes to install the OS. It just creates the disk image. It's already on to the first package. right? You skip that 20 minutes. So that the benefit from, for auto damage is it no longer in, um, limits it to just that initial OS install. You can take any disk image that you've created this way and drop it back on. You'll notice that it unchecked applied updates because it was smart enough to know that this isn't an actual OS installer. Or uh, I should say, you can also use the ESD. You don't actually have to have the full installer. You can just use the ESD if you like as well. Uh, it's smart enough to know that. So it's great for testing. It saves time. As a best practice, I definitely do recommend, though, that you, you don't use a cached version on a final build that you're going to push out. It's beautiful for testing because it saves time. But I do recommend the full doing the full install, especially if you know something's changed a new OS, you know, like especially that you were pushing out, let's say iTunes was eleven two one that made user folders disappear. Uh, or invisible, I should say. It didn't it depends what you mean by invisible or disappear. Templates. So you've done all this work, 
templates are, you know, their, their version of catalogs or manifests. All that we did, you can just, you can just go file save, command S, and it'll create a template for you. You can also roll them from scratch if you want, and you can take any template that you, has already been created and modify it. Does that look familiar? It's just a simple plist file. Right? It's XML plist. It can be modified. Uh, cur it gives it its own. It gives it. It gives it its own extension, ADTMPL, auto damage template. But you can also just use the plist extension. It will also work. So you'll see how it's built. Additional. This is the one that I built initially. So additional packages. It literally just says here are the three packages. The source source path. Wherever, I, wherever the OS installer was, it drags that in. You can, both in the GUI and in here, change the volume name of what the image is. So when you copy it over, uh, your disk will have that name. And it gives a template format date. As I mentioned, it, you can include templates in other templates. And this becomes useful you know, if any of you are programmers or something like that. You're used to having you know, routines and you know, subroutines and subroutines. It's great for organization. You know, it's even, even if you want to think of just as folders of stuff, it's great for that. Um, so you just edit the file. You can nest as many levels as you want. Some tools only have one level of nesting, so that's great. And you, can, that you have to create it by going in and writing XML files or modifying them, but you do not have to run them that way. You don't have to run them from the command line. You can. You can also run them from the GUI. So here's an example of one that has an include uh, template, an included template. This is, in fact, um, until I started doing 10.9.4, which came out after I started going on vacation. This is the template I used for, for my image. You'll notice that it has no packages at all, although it could. It just has a single include template. I do it this way for one very specific reason. Uh, the way auto damage works is if you load, if you say open a template that does this, that includes templates, it will then parse it and then list all the packages. There is no, in that bottom part of the UI, there are no folders. It just figures out what packages you actually want to install and loads them all. If I, because of my you know, 20 year old habits go command S at any one time, this file gets overwritten with a list of packages, right? So for safety, if I'm going to do in nested templates, I like my root level one to be incredibly clean so that it's dirt simple to recreate if I have to. Okay, that's just a safety measure on my part. Uh, I don't have to do it that way. You don't have to do it that way. This is just a practice that I'm following to save my own bacon. Um, so this is, what, this is the template that gets called, that I use that gets called from this. Can you tell that I have to install everything under the sun in my lab, and that's why it's 100 gigs? Right? Again, I've chosen no packages because this is how I do it. Right? Uh, I install everything I need for the techs, like a tech account, like a local admin account. Um, we use a local standard user account. I install that. I install Office. I put everything in, like Fetch, Internet, uh, Firefox. Actually, I've pulled Firefox out these days. iLife, iWork, I now got the, since we're going to Mavericks, I've got the newer versions in. Music notation, 3D modeling, audio, video animation, and, and then print, printer scripts as well. Although I've pulled, I'm starting to pull, those are actually the packages for the printers we have, not actually the, the printers themselves, not the way to create them. Here's, here's, the, here's one of the packages in. This is the one for the iLife one that I use. And this is an example of a mixed one. So I've got additional packages here. Five ones, iMovie, iPhoto. We still have iDVD because it has a use case for some of the students. With GarageBand, I've figured out what Apple downloads. You know, if you've ever done a deployment of GarageBand of the current version in Mavericks or later, you'll start it up and it'll say, oh, I've got these two gigs of stuff that you want to download, right? So I've determined where, the, where on Apple servers those installers came from. They're all packages. I downloaded them and created another template that says, 
install GarageBand app actually just like I did it that way so that when I run the App Store updates, I'll always have the current version, right? And then, and then install these 12 packages that are the audio stuff, right? That's how I get around that. Uh, if you want to know how you figure out where Apple's audio stuff is, go back and search the Mac Enterprise list. We talked about it there. Um, uh, Tim Sutton suggested the use of the tool Charles, um, which is basically lets you monitor HTTP traffic, and you can figure out where the URLs come from. And that's actually how I how I'm using it. I, when at his suggestion, I recently bought the tool, and that's how I'm getting it. There are other ways that are free that don't cost you. That was I think it was twenty thirty dollars. It wasn't that much, but there are ways to do that. If you are going to use include templates and sequence is an issue for you, then you know, like you need to have certain things installed before other things, you need to know this rule. Auto damage will parse those include templates first and then the additional packages. And since it's those templates are XML files, it does not matter whether does not matter where they are in the physical file. It just matters that the include templates will be parsed first. So let's see uh, how logy you got after lunch. Can you solve this puzzle? This is the user interaction piece. I want you to, so I've got the base template. It calls two other templates and has two loose packages in it. That first template it calls itself calls another template and has packages 11 and 12. And template two, which you saw in the first row, it has two packages, and template three has two packages. Based on the rule I just said, that include templates get parsed first, what order are the packages going to go in? Take a look. I see a lot of thinking out there. That's very good. It's not that late in the day. That's great. So who says the first package is going to be package number one? Good. How many people says the first package is going to be number 11? OK. Who says it's going to be 21? And who thinks it's 31? Oh, you guys, you are sharp. So it goes 31, 32, because that, because it drills down. It goes template one, template three. For those of you who are programmers, it's like a stack. He just pulls it off like a stack, puts, puts it on and off like a stack. Um, then it goes back up and says, oh, in template one, since we were in that, it pulls 11 and 12 next. Then it goes back up to that first one, 21 and 22, and then one and two last. Okay? So if sequence makes a difference for you, you just need to know that rule. Um, if you're not handy with editing XML files that much, see what I've done here? I've taken packages, because I want, let's say I want to use include templates because they make sense to me. I dragged three files into there. I didn't bother dragging an OS in. If I go save right now, it will happily do it, and you'll get this. So the key for where the OS is is not there because you haven't dragged it in. But that's fine. That's great. You'll notice that it still has the apply updates uh, key, that little checkbox in the UI, and the volume name for to avoid any conflict or any overwriting of settings. I simply then go in and delete those. So all we have are the packages, maybe the include templates if you have some for that, and then just the template format for completeness. right? Uh, so it's as clean as possible. Pair does document what the rules of precedence are if you leave those extra keys in. But um, for our purposes, um, that's the cleanest way to do, do it. Updates catalog. I talked to you about how. When, you, when it boots, if you've checked the preference to do so, it will go to Pairs server or to GitHub and see, are there, is there a new update to the updates list? This, is one of, this was one of the killer features of um, InstaDimage Insta with InstaUpToDate, that the community would support um, what are the latest updates, and then you'll, you can pull them directly from Apple. Right? Pair is really good about updating this, but as soon as he updates it to the latest release, any previous release is deprecated. So that automatic update function does not work for, let's say, 
uh, let's say you, you had an image, uh, an installer for 1092. It would come up and you'd drag it on and it would say that that installer is deprecated. And it would not offer the correct updates for you because it's not the current version. So that's the design decision he's made. Uh, and normally, he's actually, you have to be quick on your feet. He's usually pretty good in that uh, when 10.9.3 came out, it was like a day or two, and it was updated with the latest packages. 10.9.4, uh, it hasn't been that way because Pear is on vacation. And in Europe, they take real vacations, like two, three weeks, right? Um, so he put it out there and said, I'm on vacation. The 10.9.4 update's not going to get done. Um, is Ryan here? Ryan, actually, Ryan is here at this conference, Ryan Manley. He's, he said, OK. Well, he said, you know, uh, maybe someone would fork it, fork the GitHub repository and put that in. So Ryan did it. And so if you want to do 10.9.4, it's available, right? The updates are available. And that's the beauty of this. The community can also do it. If you choose, you can also, if you say, well, we're not ready to push out 10.9.4 yet, we haven't quality tested it, you can either fork the repository yourself and maintain older updates, or if you're not GitHub, GitHub ishy and you're not, that's not your thing, what you can also do is the, the app, when you download it, the auto damage app, has a version, and it has the version of the updates catalog at the time that version of the app was built. So I think current version, I think it has 10.9.2 in it, either 10.9.2 or 10.9.3. Um, you can, and the first time it runs and it checks for those updates, it creates this file. So in the whatever account you're running, it creates the update profiles plist. If you wish to manually manage that, that is the other way to do it. It's not the way that Pear would recommend, but it is absolutely possible. And if you were needing to go backwards, like in, for, in this case, you could simply trash that file. Oh, well, turn off updates, quit, trash the file, and start up, and it would repopulate with the latest version, or, or the version in the app, which would be not the latest version, right? So there, there are ways that you can control this. So you can be in control of those updates if you wish. Um, it, if you are running 10.7, 10.8, whatever the latest version is, the last version of those, that's what's up there. So it has update catalogs for 10.7, 10.8, including that iMac specific build I have, it supports that. So it actually has two 10.8.5 builds listed because there were two final builds. And you know, 10.9.3 to 10.9.4 right now. OK, miscellaneous things about auto damage that I haven't had a chance to mention yet. Just like Duncan McCracken's tool, um, he designed it for the community that just wants a quick way to um, get an image, just a baseline, right? So although he's added all these tremendous features that are great for those of us who knew instant image workflows, um, it's designed for simple. It can do both, but just remember if you go and ask, make feature requests, um, things that meet that his intent are more likely to get uh, adapted, adopted. But I've had great success. It's been uh, you know, we worked. Pear has been very responsive. You know, in meeting the needs. You know, and I, I was able to flush out a couple bugs. He's been very responsive, to the point where this is such an important tool. I mean, before he went on vacation, actually within probably a day or two, he had a build for Yosemite as soon as the beta was released. This is another reason when a tool is actively in development, it's another reason to consider it, and that's one of the reasons I like it. So you can talk about it in the NDA forums. You can get the um, it's forked in GitHub on that same link, so you can get it there. It's time for Q&A. If you want the slides, um, that is my, that's my work email address for all the repository of all my slides. And I'm now going to, if you want on Twitter, I've got, oh, OK, that didn't work. <laughs> 
I'll do that again. Uh, just at the end of the presentation, I will tweet out the direct link to just these slides. For those of you who were in the session yesterday, if you follow this link, you'll also see all the slide decks from yesterday. I have a separate page for all of those. So I've got all my, these are where all my presentations. Some guys use blogs, I just use a web page because I hand coded my first HTML site in 1996. So that's what's comfortable to me. Uh, and that'll, that's the link for the, for the feedback for today's session. So we're opening up for questions. And since we're recording that, uh, microphone is there. Just put up your hand and we'll uh, go from there. Uh, how do you guys uh, recommend handling uh, Mac App Store purchases that are drag and dropped into uh, auto image? Okay, are you using just straight volume purchasing? Uh, I wouldn't, in this situation, this would just be a hypothetical question. So I would say just a generic app like, um, you know, something from iWork like Keynote or something like that. Okay. So I have done it what I would call, I've, I've done it by simply taking the, getting my testing machine applying my Apple ID to it, downloading it there, packaging it, using packages, for example, and then putting that in my build. My current workflow, now that I'm, I've converted everything, so that's what I did for InstaDimage. Um, my current workflow using this, because I can actually still just drag the app there, that means I just take one extra step before I build my image, I go to the App Store, check for updates because then that means I got, automatically got the, the latest one. Having said that, I'm still going to package every update in case I have to roll back. Right? So I'm still going to use packages to drag and drop and create an installer, you know, create an installer package. So if an end user then runs the Mac App Store software update, they will not see updates uh, appear for that app? Or they will, and they'll be prompted for your credentials? Or how, would, how does that so, work? So the answer is, I don't know the answer to that question, because I locked that down. Okay. Um, I, I do not have end users. I have a shared lab, and so I can only speak from my experience. And I do use volume purchase, so I know that that, that does affect it. But what I do is I use, um, because of some software, we have copyright software that needs um, license management. So I have key server installed on my machine. I actually use that as a policy enforcement that says, you cannot run the App Store. If you try to run the App Store, block it. Right? So there could be updates sitting for days. And I still am working on trying to make it so that they don't get prompted saying, you know, there's updates. <laughs> uh, you know, it's still a work in progress. But that's, for me, it's not an issue. So I, I can't answer that question. Does anyone in the room have an answer to that question? Um, yes, they do. Okay. Okay, other questions? I had one over here. Uh, what's the quickest and most painless way to grab a, um, the OS X installer for like when 10.9.4 came out? What's the quickest and painless way that you do that? Yeah, that's a very good question. There isn't really a painless way. Uh, I mean, if I mean, ideally, if you're at an institution that has a volume license, someone should have the power to pull it. Um, for me, it depend. It yeah, it depends. Sometimes it it goes to going into the recovery partition and trying faking a, a a full reinstall. Um, I'll I'll just tell you what I do. For okay. instance, um, absolutely, I have a uh, like I have a machine running uh, VMware, mm -hmm. and then I have a 10.8 machine uh, in VMware, and then you can just go to the App Store, um, pull the latest um, OS 10 update, and Apple's kind enough to make sure that it's the latest version, mm -hmm. and then you can just do like the VMware tools share, and then you can just drag it back over to your main system, yeah. and create the image from there. Yeah, the issue bec the the tricky part becomes when the OS you are trying to grab is the same major release as the one that shipped with the machine, because then it's not in your App Store purchase list. Because one one of the easy ways is if if it was an updated machine, it's in your App Store purchase list if that's how you got it, and you just go Option click on purchased and it should show up and you should be able to just download it, right? 
that would be the least painful way. That's, that's the easiest way, but I know I've got a situation where that isn't, op isn't available to me on one of the OSs I run. Um, so that's when you get into tricky things where you, you tell it to do internet recovery, and it has to download everything from Apple, and before it goes to re reinstall, you then grab the install ESD, which will work perfectly with auto damage, and drag that in as your OS installer. Any other questions? If you go to your purchases, generally yeah. within, the, within the day, since 10.9 is free, obviously just 10.9, if you go to your purchases generally within that day, it's, it's updated. Yeah. If you purchased it, if it didn't ship with 10.9, if yeah. you shipped with 10.9, it's not there. Yeah. But I mean, if you redeem it to an account, if you yeah. have an Apple ID, you should True. be able to get it there. Question up front. If you have a developer account as well, there's actually a way for you to redeem the code for the latest uh, or, or, or whatever's there, and then it will actually appear if you sign in with your developer account. Okay. So just to repeat that for the recording, if you have a developer account and then you do have a a volume ID, you can, you can actually pull the latest version using that purchase code. Um, still got five minutes. Anyone, any questions? Anyone want to dip their toe into the auto damage plus insta up to date pool? <laughs> I can do that if you like. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So for those, for those, oh, I'll, I'll take that one because that was, yeah. I have two questions. One, on one of your slides, you had something that said clearreg.pkg. Yep. What was okay. that? So that is um, a package that, that I've had for a long time. You can, there are other, it goes by other names. But basically, if you do not want the out-of-box experience when the user boots, and you want to treat it as already registered, so you skip all the setup assist, or as much of the setup assistant as you can. Mm -hmm. There are two files you touch in the OS. That package simply says, touch those two files, right? They could also install empty files at that location. Um, use your Google foo to find it. You can create that yourself. Um, some people call it skip, set, you know, skip setup assistant. Uh, but it's a simple package, and it can be a payload-free package, or it could be a payload full package with two hidden files. It, whoops, I had a second part. Yep. And since your build is so large, yeah. do you ever run anything like monolingual to strip out all the... Hell no. Lproj, no. Hell no. Okay. Why? Why? Uh, the question, that's why que the question to me is, why mess with apps? And to me, I'd rather push out 100, 110 compared to 100, because the big part of the payload is sound, is audio for me, right? Saving five gigs and potentially um, corrupting an app is not worth it for me. I, it's not worth it. I, hard, storage is cheap these days. I, now I, I don't have a machine that has less than a 320 gig hard drive. The five gigs isn't going to make a difference that I'm going to save. You had a question? The microphone's right there. Um, uh, I, I was just going to point out about the, the clear reg stuff. Yeah. I think if you're taking this image and building it and then deploying it with Deploy Studio, Deploy Studio has a workflow that will do basically the same thing, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. OK. Yeah, it's just I, I yeah. In the, there are things that I actually do in Deploy Studio that I could do elsewhere and vice versa. You know, I could create accounts in Deploy Studio. I choose to cre use, create user package because I, then I can use it in different circumstances. I can push out a brand new user using create user package. So that's, you know, after a machine's been deployed. So that's how I choose to work it. Um, so three minutes. Um, for the people who have been using InstaDimage, you, a trick I figured out was if you just run the portion of Insta up to date, you just run the Insta up to date without the minus P option, where you are simply getting it to collect and order your packages, you can do that and then take that list of packages and installers and drag them into the additional packages area of auto DMG or auto damage, it will work. And it used to be when I first did it, because I did build an image that way. When I first did it, you had it didn't support uh, disk images that had packages in them, didn't support disk images that had apps in them. Actually, didn't support the the latter, not the former. It now supports that. So everything that InstaDimage could install, it can now install. So you literally should be able to drag those. I don't know if they're I can't remember if they're sim links or. I can't remember if they're hard or soft links. Oh, there's there's sim links of some sort. You drag those in. 
it just works. So just drag your OS in, drag your packages in, and it works. Uh, I ended up converting over to the Insta, uh, the auto damage templates, and it works. Uh, and it did it only took it took me a while because I had, you know, when I did the original test, I had 130 packages. Right? Because I break, you know, like the garage, you know, Logic, Logic Pro, to put all the sounds in, that's 40 packages on its own. Right? So that's one of the reasons I love these modular things. I don't have to find those packages. I find them once, I catalog them, and I include them. Right? It's easy that way. Now, I don't think I could do that in Deploy Studio, which is the main tool I'm using to deploy. So it, it just works. I've converted mine over. Um, but you have to remember those sequencing things. In, inst uh, in Instant Image, you know you're going to have a particular sequence. With the XML files, you don't. You have to use that with templates. I've got 10 seconds. I'll be happy to hang around and answer questions. Thank you for being such an attentive audience. I really appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you.